Ayan na, ayan na mga kameta. Mukhang uh, hindi ganun kaganda ang connection natin ngayon na, pero tinitry natin. Para dito kasama natin mga kameta natin sa YouTube, sa Facebook, iba't ibang platform. Ayan, ginagamit ko na lang sarili kong internet dun sa kabila para mas maganda yung connection. Ito ha mga kameta, pag-usapan natin today itong pagbisita ng Prime Minister ng Malaysia, Prime Minister Anwar Ibrahim. Uh, in fact, you know, medyo I feel, uh, you know, missing out because uh, dadan po siya sa UP Asian Center kung saan nagtuturo po tayo tomorrow. Uh, unfortunately, I won't be able to make it uh, to, the, to the meeting. Uh, medyo out of town tayo. Pero makonfer siya ng honorary degree and, and different kinds of award by University of Philippines and my alma mater and also my institution there in UP, yung Asian Center at speech si... Anwar Ibrahim, ang Prime Minister ng Malaysia dyan. So, obviously, mga kameta, um, Anwar Ibrahim is a very special kind of Prime Minister. He's someone, especially for us, mga Pilipino, no? he's someone who's very familiar with Philippine politics. He's someone who's very familiar with ating people power revolution, with ETSA. He's very, very familiar, personally very familiar, not this year, not last year, but throughout the decades with the Aquino families. And on many occasions, he cited Ninoy and the Aquinos as some sort of inspiration uh, for his politics. And that makes him very different because alam natin, karamihan ng mga leaders ng mga ating mga kapitbahay na bansa, uh, these are leaders who are much more you know, authoritarian in their mindset, much more illiberal in their mindset, some of them more populist in their mindset. So in fact, for a very long time in Pilipinas, by unique sa region because we had at least a semblance of a liberal democracy which was very different from what you had from what was very prevalent uh John in some neighboring countries no uh obviously there are big debates about which one works which is better obviously marami dito sa Pilipinas ay nag romanticize ng situation in Singapore which by the way is a city state really not comparable in terms of overall national political economy and planning Maybe Metro Manila is comparable. We can learn a thing or two, except we have to take care of the provinces, rural areas. We have insurgencies, blah, 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 blah. A lot of things, thousands of problems that Singapore doesn't have to take care of. Uh, but obviously, there are also examples of Malaysia, example of Thailand, which under more authoritarian leaders than the Philippines were able to achieve a semblance of growth and stability. But it's not like we didn't have 20 years of authoritarian systems, at least. No, I mean, put in the martial law period, until the end of Marcos' dictatorship, put in also some few years from Tata, among others, you got easily two decades of authoritarian system in the Philippines, but it's not like the economic record is as, as clear or as impressive as what we saw in, in Thailand under Taksin or different kind of regimes, no authoritarian, or under Malaysia or Singapore, or even Indonesia under Suharto, no? uh, for that matter, and to a lesser degree, of course, Sukarno. No? Now, Pag-usapan natin yan mga kameta because uh, pansin niyo, of course, yung column din natin sa inquiry uh, the other day was also about uh, legacy of Ninoy, legacy of Gandhi, and also the disinformation crisis that we have in the country. As you may know mga kameta, ang stance po natin sa issue ng uh, disinformation ay major more nuance. It's different. Uh, I, I understand saan galing yung frustration ng mga iba dyan, especially yung mga kakamping dyan or yung mga tinatawag na dilawan dyan, or uh, although the two are not necessarily the same. As I always say, there's a difference between them. Also, there's also concern with vis-a-vis uh, -vis disinformation by people in the academe, in the journalism world, who are not necessarily aligned to any political party or don't have a very strong political persuasion in, as far as the Philippines is concerned. No? Uh, they have general concerns about where the, one, the country wants to go, but don't necessarily have a clear leaning, no? partisan leaning or ideological leaning. Now, if you look at it, so disinformation is indeed a problem. And katulad ng uh, sinulat natin dun sa article natin uh, yesterday sa uh, Philippine Daily Inquirer, uh, you know, now not only institutions of democracy are under, coming under attack. So yung mga journalists, mga katulad natin, uh, academics, katulad natin, mga, uh, mga statesmen na uh, affiliated with progressive movement or liberals, either na re sila or na sila as dilawan, whatever. Uh, hindi lang na attack of course yung mainstream media and independent media outlets that's a more important thing more than the mainstream it's the independent media which is important here hindi yung uh, you know controlled by the state or controlled by the cronies of the state or st cronies of tata yung mga ganun um, or beshi ni tata yung mga ganun alright um, obviously that that's something that we have discussed for quite some time mga kameta 
But katulad ng sinabi natin, you have to understand why ang mga kababayan natin, or marami sa ating kababayan, they're not as worried about disinformation, right? They're not as worried about the problem of inaccuracies when it comes to uh, track record of different politicians, when it comes to, uh, you know, what are the basic political facts or hindi masyadong concerns uh, fact-checking among others. And, of course, we also see a lot of people, supposedly very educated people, well-educated people, who seem susceptible or seem open to some of the more grandiose claims and promises by, you know, populist charlatans, for instance. Yung mga, yung mga promise na babangon tayo kaagad, yung promise na six months magiging ano tayo, Singapore tayo, yung mga ganitong bagay, no? Yung mga, mga kalokohan ng mga promises na obviously hindi, ma, uh, ma, hindi realistic, obviously hindi applicable sa reality, obviously may problema sa mga yan. Alright, mga kameta. Um, so for me, you have to understand bakit maraming tao ay susceptible dyan or maraming tao ay open sa, let's say, quote-unquote disinformation or less, the other term that they use is also post-facts politics. No, isang political kung saan hindi relevant ang facts. Ang important are emotions. Our importance are relatability. Our em- uh, important are impressions, instincts, etc. No, And this is the environment where, of course, populism thrives very well because populists by nature are charismatic people who can manipulate people's emotions or they can at least appeal to fundamental instinctive feelings and aspirations and hopes and angers uh, of uh, angers and emotions and sentiments of the voters. Now, that makes populists really important. Now, the Greeks had a term for it. They they called populists demagogues, right? And they felt that they were really threats to democracy or they're what make, made democracy really problematic. So you look at the works of Socrates, Aristotle, or rather Plato, drawing on the works of Socrates. Of course, Socrates himself would be executed because a bunch of demagogues in uh, you know in, in Athens went after him. Um, you can read the biography on your own. We can have a completely separate video or vlog on Socrates and his uh, his really fascinating life. Now, the thing kasi ganito is, ang problema ko dun sa isang line of argument on disinformation is that, uh, of course, I'm gonna go to the next one, which is disinformation against uh, democratic icons from Gandhi to Ninoy and so on and so forth. Balikan natin yan, mga kamet. In fact, Anwar himself uh, you know, has allegedly been also a victim of disinformation. He was imprisoned multiple times on charges of sodomy or something like that, which he always dismissed and he claimed that they were totally false and totally had no basis in truth. But he was imprisoned for that and marginalized in politics. So, so Anwar Ibrahim himself knows about the problem of disinformation because, you know, uh, he was a victim of it. Uh, in many ways, in the worst way possible for a top-level politician like him who was a deputy prime minister decades earlier and was a contender for the top position for the past 20 uh, 20 years, sorry, two decades until he was able to seal the deal and get the prime minister office uh, recently. Now, going back to this, um, going back to this, mga kameta, pag-usapan natin ito. Mm, So, one of the things you have to understand is why are people open to disinformation or why disinformation is so effective? So the problem is that most of the standard, quote-unquote, liberal analysis is in economics parlance, uh, they're supply side. You know, they just look at, oh, my troll farms, my political na support as a troll farms, or oh, yung Facebook, YouTube, hindi, hindi sila, uh, you know, um, they're not as uh, you know, vigilant when it comes to dealing with disinformation. There's a problem with algorithm. Maria Ressa, Rappler folks have done a lot of research on this. This has been their essentially, you know, uh, you know, essentially their main advocacy, you know, really going after top platforms for not, not doing their jobs because after all, they're also victim of disinformation, etc. Now, I get that. There's, there's value in understanding supply side of a disinformation problem. But we have to also understand the demand side of, supply, of the disinformation problem. Why are people open to disinformation? Why are many people tolerant with disinformation, if not openly uh, you know, supportive or susceptible to disinformation? This is where, mga kameta, we have to understand the demand side. So, uh, first of all, one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that historically, if you look at a lot of societies around the world, including in the Philippines, no, we have... Uh, we have a col- we have a political culture that is not necessarily obsessed with getting all the facts right right and when it comes to our attitude towards leadership when it comes to our understanding of what is a good leader 
if you look at pre in pre-Hispanic period, imperial period, etc., we know that our ideas of leadership and competence and governance, etc., are not necessarily quote unquote data driven, right? They're more driven by impressions, they're more driven by instincts, feelings, etc. So, first of all, we have that, let's just call it illiberal or pre-data, pre-fax kind of political culture, right? So it's kind of pre-modern in a sense, and that has persisted into many modern societies, including the United States, right? Um, I mean, come on, I mean, we're, we're talking about countries that have, you know, centuries of slavery and all, and that slavery, that institution of slavery was sustained based on all sorts of horrible lies and distortions and all, and, and you would expect that that problematic political culture would just go away. No, uh, so we see uh, mutations of that very problematic uh, culture, you know, echoing way into the 21st century, and potentially more, no? Naka civil war pa nga sila over that. But anyway, um, so there's definitely that, uh, let's say, medieval or that, not medieval, but pre-modern political culture that persists in many countries, from developed countries like the U.S. to developed countries in Latin America, in Asia, Africa, so on and so forth, no? Not to mention even in some European countries. We saw during the Second World War in, or in the run-up to the Second World War, many fell for you know, the Mussolini's of this world or the worst versions uh, because they believe in all sorts of lies. Even when they were supposedly educated and informed and all, they rather believed in the lies because those lies were comfortable for them. Those lies were convenient, right? Those were those lies appealed to their emotions, their anger, etc. And actually, I, I can be even more philosophical about this. If you go to the works of David Hume, right, the Scottish philosopher, he would argue that Fundamentally, when it comes to human nature, it's the emotions that drive logic and rationality than the other way around. But this is not going to be a lecture on David Hume and rationality. But in a sense, as far as evolution and biology is concerned, as far as our human nature is concerned, there's a part of us where that, that always puts convenience, emotional convenience, over hard truths and hard facts, right? This is just part of our coping mechanism. It's a psychological human nature thing, right? But there's even something more fundamental here at stake, no, Mahakamenta. My argument here is that the reason why pro-populist, pro-authoritarian populist disinformation works very well nowadays is precisely because of loss of confidence in standard liberal democratic politics. Now, what, and this is what I found really fascinating nung nagbaba, nagbabasa tayo ng isang essay by this very, very brilliant uh, Indian author. Um, eto, pakita natin siya. When he wrote an essay for the Financial Times uh, recently kung saan pinag-usapan niya how in India, which is of course under a populist authoritarian kind of uh, political wave right now, no less than Gandhi, no? One of the most admired figures, right? No less than Gandhi is now coming under attack. Now, if you know about Gupta, he's an author of really fascinating books. I remember, uh, you know, a uh, few years ago when I was dropping by India, it was, or some, during one of the, my first visits to India, I would see all, all the time his biography of Gandhi. This is the br brilliant biography he wrote of Gandhi. Uh, in the airport, everywhere, everywhere, uh, everywhere and it was it's really highly reviewed and and admired so if you really want to read about gandhi his background etc i really suggest you no know, uh reading the books of ramachandra uh sorry guha not gupta sorry ramachandra guha uh including at all young very interesting book name about gandhi before india uh, which talks about gandhi's background in south africa and a little bit of a not so let's say um saint-like background that Gandhi had, no? Uh, which obviously will be used by a lot of his critics later on to question how progressive he is, or by people who just don't want his legacy and want to diminish his contribution to a better India or more inclusive and democratic India, etc. Now, uh, Ramachandra had a very interesting essay, as I said, in Financial Times, kung saan pinag niya how Gandhi right now is coming under attack in India. So, I mean, this is Gandhi, right? I mean, my goodness. It cannot get bigger than him when it comes to uh, icon, uh, you know, democratic icons of the 20th century, right? He was chosen as one of the most influential figures of the 20th century for a reason, no? Now, according to the author, 
Gandhi is coming atta- under attack in recent years. Um, now, obviously, you can see where this this conversation is going, right? Because you know we're going to talk about Nino next, no? So, kung basahin niyo yung ating article, mga kameta, we have some direct quotations from uh, Guha. One second, let me just bring it back, bring it up. Of course, I cannot show the uh, article per se because it's uh, behind paywall. Siya eh. May mga techniques naman to get through the paywall, but I'm not in the business of getting into that. All right, so this is the interesting thing. So, uh, so of course, Mahatma Gandhi, uh, or, or yeah, Mahatma Gandhi, or Mohandas Mahatma Gandhi, is hailed as the father of the nation. But as Ramachandra Goa says, uh, the icon, the democratic icon of India, in India, the public mood is turning hostile towards Gandhi. So in the past, conspiratorially minded Marxist intellectuals accused Gandhi of being, quote, an agent simultaneously of the British colonial state and of the Indian capitalist class, whose nonviolent was nonviolent struggle was supposedly, quote, a cunning device to win the masses away from the revolutionary path. So if you look at it, this attack against Gandhi by some leftist progressive groups is very analogous to the attack of some leftist people agoncillo types of this world against Rizal, right? Like this, uh, Rizal is not a, a real hero because supposedly he was really against true revolution. He wanted to do reform. So in a sense, he was uh, enabling the empire. You know, that kind of nonsensical arguments we see from some of the more left-leaning, supposedly progressive uh, authors, etc. So Gandhi has been also coming under attack for a long time from more, from more leftist elements. In fact, the Naxalites or Maoist insurgency groups based in West Bengal have been vandalizing and even destroying Gandhi's statues because they question his contribution to India and, and they say that you know he he essentially perpetuated the caste system and he didn't really help India to move forward, so on and so forth. Again, you see where this argument is going, no? So as Goa notes, however, India's democratic icon is now facing systematic assault by more mainstream authoritarian populist elements nowadays. Hindi lang from left, hindi lang from some weirdos here and there, but now they're, he's coming under attack also from mainstream po- populist elements who have gone so far as, quote, hailing Gandhi's assassin. Remember, Gandhi was assassinated by Nutharam Godse, who is now being even hailed as a kind of a patriot. And there's a praise for him trending on Twitter every January 30, and there are periodic plans to erect statues to him and temples in his memory, according to Goha. And according to Goha also, there are videos, quote, mocking Gandhi and charging him with betraying the majority religion, uh, relig- uh, the religious majority, and those videos have gone viral. So for Goa, what is taking place in India right now is lot, n- nothing less than ito mga kameta, parricide, P-A-R-R-I-C-I-D-E, which according to him means, quote, the outright repudiation of the person who perhaps did more than anyone else to nurture this nation into being, right? And why am I talking about Gandhi? Because, of course, Gandhi is like the ultimate, like, um, let's say, archetype of a great democratic leader or an icon of tolerance and democratic politics for the modern era. Now, if you look at the Philippines, you could say Rizal, in a way, prefigured Gandhi in his own way. But it was really Ninoy who came closest to kind of a Filipino version of Gandhi because, the Filip- uh, because Ninoy had an influence on how uh, you know there will be a people power later on that was also very nonviolent and very similar to what Gandhi also was uh, was espousing for earlier in the century. Now, katulad ng sinabi natin, if you, if you look at it, hindi pa similar din yung nangyari kay Ninoy. So for a long time, if you look at Ninoy, uh, his brand of liberal democracy has come under attack by a lot of progressive liberals, uh, progressive in the Philippines who believe that his form of liberalism never went far enough to institute transformative change in the Philippines. Now, what we see interestingly is that there are also more mainstream authoritarian populist elements in the Philippines, similar to India, who are also attacking Ninoy and also attaching all sorts of horrible things to him. They're, they're accusing him of being opportunist by going back and discussing his more traditional politician background when he was way younger, not his mature years. There, there are people who talk about him as a supposed communist and a traitor, etc. In fact, interestingly, we have no less than Tatay Enrile, ay, Tatay rin ba, Lola Enrile, no? Uh, Mang Johnny, no? Who was, who has been very interested, was really been going after Ninoy. So, uh, more recently, na fact check siya ng media because uh, Enrile was 
uh, repeating these unfounded claims that Nino Aquino ay nag-organize ng CPP NP at MNLF so that that uh, you know that the uh, that Ninoy is behind all of these insurgency problems, etc. When in fact, anyone who knows what, what's happening knows that it was the Marcos dictatorship that actually empowered these movements, uh, all sorts of insurgency. So, mabugi mga insurgency and pano ni Marcos, and especially during martial law, etc. And we have been still grappling with these problems up until today. So, this is the interesting thing. Can you see like the parallels between the attack on Gandhi in India and attack on Ninoy in the Philippines? From both left for a long time, but now both mainstream or mainstream authoritarian populist movement with their supporters in Tatay, supporters in Marcoses, uh, supporters in Mangjani, etc. They have been attacking. I mean, that's very similar to also what's happening in India, right? Now, I'm not necessarily saying that Gandhi and Nina are exactly the same people with exactly the same kind of contribution at exactly the same kind of quote unquote greatness. No, but as far as the Philippines is concerned, Nino comes closest to our own version of a Martin Luther King Jr. or at least a version of a Gandhi, right? Uh, because of not how he started his politics, but how his politics ended, or rather his life ended, and therefore, he, well, actually, his life ended, but even if his life ended, it con it, it, it spurred into action a kind of a, of a non-violent popular revolution, which is very close to the spirit of what, uh, man, uh, what you know, people like Martin Luther King Jr. or people like um, uh, Mahatma Gandhi have been espousing for. Now, if you look at it, obviously it doesn't make sense to attack Gandhi for many things that went wrong in India because as Goa correctly points out, the problem is not necessarily with Gandhi per se, although you may read this great book by Perry Anderson, someone I very respect. He has a book called The Indian Ideology and dun sa book niya talagang inatak niya si Gandhi. And for him, it was really Gandhi's version of politics that contributed to the problems that India is facing today. But putting aside more leftist progressive thinkers like Perry Anderson, if you look at it, the argument of more centered, uh, centrist or let's say non-ideological or post-ideological uh, you know, scholars or observers uh, like uh, Ramachandra Guha is this. And this is what I really feel is relevant to our understanding of why this formation works in the Philippines. You no. Know? So ayon kay Guha, the desertification of Gandhi has been aided by the hypocrisy and the misconduct of the Congress Party. And as you know, the Congress Party is attached to the Nehru Gandhi family who dominated Indian politics for more than three decades at least. No, actually almost half a century, right? And they're now this main liberal opposition party, but they were in the main party for a long time. And kay Guha... This party, which dominated Indian politics for decades, especially after independence of India, this is the problem with them. They had politicians who were ostentatiously wearing homespun cotton, meaning pahambal, etc., while promoting cronyism and corruption. And this is what I'm saying, mga kameta. Isn't it also similar in the Philippines? Nino is also now being blamed for all the shortcomings of not obviously himself or not necessarily even Corazon Aquino, who had to deal with multiple coup d'etats and the debt crisis and so on and so forth. But a lot of self-described liberal politicians and liberal uh, thought leaders and liberal journalists or whatever, who actually enabled or directly perpetuated a culture of incompetence and in some cases even corruption while singing praises for the Aquino family. Kaya nga sabi natin mga kameta, if you really want to fight, fight this information, you have to acknowledge this first. Bakit maraming tao ay open sa pro-populist, pro-authoritarian, tatay-style disinformation because punong-puno na sila. Because galit na galit sila. Because pagod na pagod sila. Doon sa mga kapalpakan na nangyayari under self-styled, more liberal-leaning officials, politicos, etc. No? Well beyond the direct contribution of the Aquino family. And we know, under Aquino presidents, there were many people who were not really the best people who were placed in charge of many top, you know, departments, etc. I mean, we can go talk about what happened with Mama Sapan. We can go and talk about what happened with all of the delayed infrastructure projects, so on and so forth. We can talk about the Laglag Bala problem. We can talk about so many kapalpakan ng nangyari, even under relatively good presidents like Aquino. I think Aquino was a pretty decent president by Philippine standards, at least compared to other presidents. But still, we had a lot of kapalpakan ng nangyari nun, and a lot of very questionable officials 
who, who were there, you know, whether it's in, in your transportation sector, whether it's, you know, when it comes to dealing with insurgency issues, so on and so forth. No? And, you know, I think I began to see Mayor Magalang, of course, talked about this because he investigated, for instance, the Mamasapan issue. And that gives you an idea of why Marami Hindi believe Machado, you know, sa mga liberal politics in the Philippines because they saw that even if the Aquino family had good intentions for the country, even if they were not corrupt themselves, which is a great thing as far as the Philippines is concerned. And even if President Aquino himself, the two Aquinos did many good things for the country, etc. There were still many officials who were part of the Liberal Party, who were attached to liberalism, uh, who sang the, praises, sang the praises of Aquinos, and yet they came sh short on so many fronts. And we didn't have inclusive development during the Aquino period. Let's be very clear about it. We had far more growth and macroeconomic stability than Tate period, than Chingo Estrade period, than Arroyo period, than Marcos Senior period. Sure, no question about it. It's an improvement on that. But we didn't have inclusive development because some fundamental issues were not addressed. Land reform, trade and industrial policy, so on and so forth, right? And even in foreign policy, I had some disagreements with the previous Aquino administration in terms of I felt it was not as proactive in balancing. It was much too much aligned to the U.S. and I felt that's why we were taking it a bit for granted. But anyway, we can have a debate about that later on. So for me, that's why the best way to fight disinformation is to acknowledge widespread disenchantment with the racinated liberal elites or self-described liberal elites and reverse take its long political adulteration of Nino's ideological legacy, all right? You ma dapat hindi natin hayaan na, 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 di ba, na, I, I, I'm don't, I don't know how to put it politely. I use the word adulteration because there's a there's a worst word. Now. I'm not sure how PC it is, but you, you get my point, right? So beyond toxic self-righteousness, which is the super annoying thing we see with, with a lot of these uh, supposed supporters of opposition who super horrible people, right? Because all they do is just try to cancel out everyone else and spread toxicity and nonsense. And they never apologize for the nonsense they did during the last elections, including attacks on really good people like Ronnie Holmes, our colleague who's, who's there in Pulse Asia. Uh, the really horrible, stupid things they did, you know, in terms of, uh, you know, talking about, you know, certain analytics, analytics, ek, ek, ne, no, they, they owe apologies to, to Ronald Holmes, I think a lot of our friends, and they, ha they have to acknowledge that their so-called analytics was super out of this world. And I pointed out that, that thing last year over and over and over again. Anyway, there's nothing wrong with raising expectations, but it has to be based on credible analysis and data. That's what's very important, Mahakameta, here. Kaya sabi ko, beyond toxic self righteousness and election result denialism. Marcos Jr. won. Now, we can debate about whether it was exactly the number. Okay, but the fact that he won it, and, and the gap seems to be very big, and we can see the, if, if Marcos really didn't win it, why is approval rating so high? So you're going to say everything is conspiracy. The nonsense then. The full conspiracy theories na lang tayo. na tayo mag-usap, ba? Anyways, what we need is a genuinely progressive movement for democratic transformation. And I think Nino himself would have been very critical of toxic self-righteousness and election result denialism. And more than that, of all of these paliberal people who only gave bad name to liberal democracy, right? Now, which brings me back to Anwar. Anwar is very interesting, Mahakameta, because uh, as I mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Anwar for a long time really had a lot of praise for the Aquino family, for Ninoy. He talked about Ninoy's martyrdom. He talked about Corazon Aquino, right, who back then at least was portrayed as a kind of saint of, of democracy. And he also had a very heartfelt, very emotional, passionate, and really sincere um, um, essay, no? Actually, or post niya, no? Nung after uh, nagpasa away na si Aquino, the third, no? Uh, Benigno Aquino, si Pinoy, no? So you can check these articles yourself. I'm going to post it here, Mahakameta. But you can see, I mean, at pinostin natin, Mahakameta, yan dun sa ating Twitter. So I can also send you the... I can also send you the... Oh, ito, ito, one second. Na. The links. Don't worry about it. Oh, whether Mahakameta natin on YouTube or Facebook. I don't know problem, it's dark na dito. One second, mga kameta. Oh, wait lang. Nasaan yung isa? Oh, dapat natin yung light natin dito. Ah, ito, ito, ito. So, for instance, look at... Uh, what Anwar said on Corazon Aquino in this uh, Time Magazine piece in 2009, written by Hannah Beach. 
you can also uh, look at this inquire piece for instance and war sites the martyrdom of of Ninoy and what that means for the struggle for democracy and how he personally was inspired by that. Uh, last year, I think November, no na sa Bali tayo, we also discussed about uh, Anwar Ibrahim, kakapanalo lang niya, and about the emotional eulogy that he had to President Aquino, for instance, uh, I mean Pinoy, no, not Ninoy, but Pinoy. So you can check these things on your own, ipopost ko sa baba. So just to give you an idea na, you know, everything we say is based on research and evidence and all that. Uh, of course, last time when Prime Minister Mahathir was here in the Philippines, I got to to meet him and interview him. You can find that online for free. Uh, this time, we didn't meet him si Anwar ngayon, but hopefully next time we'll have a chance to catch up with him. Anyways, mga kamita, parang haba yata ng pinag-usapan natin. Nahanap, nahanap na tayo dyan. Paligan natin issue na ito, no? Soon. Now, obviously for me, what's interesting is seeing Anwar now who sang the praises of the Aquinas for a very long time. Genuinely, is now, of course, going to meet Marcos Jr., who's the son of the Betanoa of the Aquinos. No? But obviously, he's a diplomat. Anwar Ibrahim is a politician and diplomat. And Bongo Marcos is also a diplomat and politician. I think both of them are going to focus on what's important for a bilateral cooperation for a country, etc. And as much as possible, perhaps, they will try to avoid any kind of awkward conversation when it comes to Aquinos, etc. In fairness, someone to Marcos Jr., during the EDSA commemoration the other day, nagpadala siya ng brief, nagpadala siya ng isang statement on reconciliation. So instead of rocking the boat and looking for a fight, a la Tatay Digong style, uh, he, he wants to move forward in a way without necessarily giving in, right? So let's see how things are going to move forward. But of course, I expect officially this meeting is all going to be about bilateral cooperation, peace in Mindanao, trade, investments, a little bit of maritime security, joint patrols, etc. But for me, it's still fascinating, isn't it? Like that, uh, uh, you know, the Malaysian Prime Minister right now, who used to be a, a huge admirer of the Aquinos, now is entering the country as a Prime Minister, finally. And his counterpart is a Marcus Jr. Very interesting. Only in the Philippines you see things like that, right? All right. Um, maybe one day we can arrange an interview with Prime Minister Anwar, just like how we interviewed Prime Minister Mahathir and asking about this, but I'm, I'm sure there you go. he's going to give a complete diplomatic and nice response. All right. Okay, mga kameta, thank you very much again sa lahat ng mga support sa atin dito sa YouTube, sa, um, sorry, sa Facebook. Tignan ko ngayon mga comments dito. But di ko nakikita. Ayan, ayan mga ko. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and dami mga comments dito si Chris. Sabi niya, hindi pwede mga pangako, pangako lang ng good governance. Yeah, exactly. We, we can see in a lot of surveys, no, na, na people are more tolerant of corruption as long as it creates at least, uh, uh, it creates at least more uh, effective governance. So, ang, ang priority ng tao ngayon is effective governance, someone who can do things, someone who can get things done, right? Even if major marahas, even if major questionable lang in background, hindi as much in corruption. We can see, for instance, that in the surveys, when in 2009 and 10, corruption was a top issue. That was no longer the case 2019 onwards. Mas issue yung, of course, 2016, mas issue in drug, etc. And then now mas issue in economia, uh, basic things like inflation, education, etc. So clearly, the good governance mantra that has lost the kind of luster and the kind of uh, let's say, um, appeal that it used to have. So that's why the Philippines moved forward. That's why last year, right? and crit I, I critique the main line of uh, uh, opposition, uh, especially yung, ano, the overemphasis in, I think, yung, yung malinis na gobierno. I mean, I'm, I'm great with that. Of course, we need a good governance. But the reality is that the tapat na gobierno it's not as, as much a priority to the voters. We can see this clearly in the numbers and studies and all. But obviously, no one listens to us, right? Sino ba naman tayo? We're just someone who knows actually the facts, the data and studies, is right? But hindi naman tayo malapit sa mga politiko. Hindi naman tayo mga influencer or partisan influencer, ganon. Hindi naman tayo ganon. So, ganon. Wala na nakikinig sa atin, kaya ganon tayo. Anyway, at least kayo mga kameta, nakinig kayo sa akin. So, I really appreciate that. And at least I got the message out here. And, and you can see, mga kameta, lahat ng mga pinag-usapan natin dito, pinag-isipan pinag natin ng matagal. Talagang masinsinan natin na analyze yan. Hindi lang basta-basta. So, so, yun po yung ginagawa natin dito, mga kameta. Alright? Thank you very much again, mga kameta, for a fantastic conversation as always. And hope we can continue this conversation for... Uh, wait lang. I'm just checking kung andyan pa rin ba kayo. Alright. Gabi na eh. Okay. 
Anyways, thank you very much mga Kameta for this. Balikan ko kayo at magte-thank you na rin ako dun sa mga nagbigay ng star and support among others. I really appreciate it. Talk to you soon. God bless.